Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. This week's episode is a recording of one of our Global Autism Community exclusive events. The topic of this roundtable discussion was coping with stress and sensory overload. Participating in this event were autism self-advocates Thomas Island, Robert Schmoos, Mary Johnston, and David Sharif, as well as community members Colleen Dorsey, Danielle Terrell, and Kia Burton. In today's conversation, we discuss triggers in public spaces, making stores more neurodiverse-friendly, Halloween for children with disabilities, workplace stressors, requesting accommodations, conflicts with other people, the spoon theory, and tips for travelers. In this episode, discover what's possible when the right tools are in your box. To learn more about the participants in this discussion, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. Roundtable discussions like the one you'll hear today are open exclusively for members of our online global autism community. We select a different theme each month, and our moderators monitor posts daily to ensure that our online space remains safe and respectful. If you'd like to attend and participate in any of our future events, You can sign up today at community.globalautismproject.org. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast, subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project, And join our community on Mighty Networks at community.globalautismproject.org. And now, I present you the Global Autism Community. So thank you all for coming again. And I just want to go over the format for everyone. Just to preface, I do want to say this is a safe space. And everyone here, you can trust that there is no judgment. You are free to share from your heart and be vulnerable. I also want to go over another, I guess you could say it's kind of a rule here with the Global Autism Project when we have these events. It's called No Stueso, and I'm going to put it in the chat. And this stands for No One Speaks Twice Until Everyone Speaks Once. So this is a way to make sure that Everyone speaks even just for a little bit, at least once, so that they have a chance to share what's on their mind. Now, if you don't want to share, that's okay too. No pressure. There's also something that you get out of just listening. And given the topic of today's discussion, which is coping with stress and sensory overload, We might hit some trigger points and some sensitive issues with some people. Part of the the purpose of having this roundtable is so that you know that you're not alone. And as people are sharing stories, you might find a little bit of yourself in that story too. And that's kind of the beauty of community, right? The main theme of today is coping with stress and sensory overload. And we have some subtopics also which are going to be triggers in public spaces, workplace stressors, conflicts with other people, and tips while traveling. So before we get into the topics, I'd like to just go around and do a a quick introduction from everyone. Also, we can welcome Danielle to the community, and I think everyone else knows each other here. So maybe we can start. Mary, how about you? Hi, everybody. I'm Mary, and I run a blog called Autistic Rainbow 15. I actually started it last year in quarantine, and I really love running it because I get to speak about my life as a queer neurodivergent activist and get to meet other people like me and just spread awareness and acceptance and really get to connect with new people is a really enjoyable part of it. 
And I also really love these meetings that I get to do with you guys because we get to discuss important topics. Thanks, Mary. And Bob. Hello, everyone. My name is Bob or Robert, either one. I am a autistic self-advocate. I'm also a licensed therapist. I love speaking on autistic, autistic relate advocacy and how to help others with the self-advocate, self-advocate for them, themselves as well. And I've been doing a lot of speaking engagements and wrote many articles regarding it. I love being here. Thanks, Bob. And Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Island. I'm in Santa Clarita, California, just north of Los Angeles. I'm on the autism spectrum. I am a certified human potential coach. I'm starting a business called Come to Life Coaching based on the title of my Amazon best-selling book called Come to Life. And I help currently young men to discover who they are, what they want, and how they can make the world a better place. And in my spare time, I like to, I actually took up uh, triathlons, like Ironman triathlons. I put on the COVID-19 and decided to work it off by running, biking, and swimming. And I ran a half Ironman three months ago and finished it. And now I'm looking to do a full. And no one, to my knowledge, on the autism spectrum has ever finished a full. So I could be the first. Wow. Good luck, Tom. That's awesome. And Danielle. Um, hello, I'm Danielle, new to the community, so thank you for the welcome. Um, I'm currently a graduate student. I'll be finishing up in a few weeks in December, I'm getting my Master's of Science in Developmental Disabilities with a concentration in leadership and advocacy and a concentration in ABA. And my professional background, I've worked um, with kids and adults with autism and other developmental and intellectual disabilities in a variety of settings. I just love everything that I do. Um, so I'm happy to be here and I'm excited. Thanks, Danielle. And David. Hi, I am David Sharif. I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, now live in Queens, New York City. I am a magna cum laude graduate of Pace University with a degree in political science and peace and justice studies. As an autism self-advocate, I am thriving to still do speaking engagements but thankfully, before that, I have been on more podcast episodes and have done more moderating, which I am very fortunate to be doing with moderating these wonderful roundtables with all of you. And since the pandemic, I have created some websites. And in one full year, I have lost more than 45 pounds. Congratulations, David. Mm -hmm. And Kia. Hi, everyone. I'm Kia. I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia, currently residing in Texas. I'm a board certified behavior analyst. The populations that I typically have worked with are adults with disabilities that are in like a transitional phase to independent living and focusing on vocational skill as well as well as severe behavior. So severe self-interest behavior, severe aggression. Those are kind of my specialties, and I'm a moderator with the Global Austin Project, so you will see my face a lot in the community on several posts throughout the week. All right. Now, let's jump right in. So our first topic that we're going to go over is triggers in public spaces. Now, this kind of includes all public spaces you can think of, grocery stores, restaurants, sporting events. So. I want to open it up to the self-advocates. Is anyone here especially stressed in public spaces? Mary, would you like to share? Yeah. So for me personally, grocery stores are kind of my biggest kryptonite, if that makes sense. I'm somebody who's really like sensitive with different sensory realms. I get really overwhelmed with light and loud noises. I'm not good with like unexpected plans or changes or reactions. So going out is really difficult for me. And I actually have like a little autism bag that I take with me where I carry headphones and a weighted blanket in case I need it. I always have like backup water in case I need to like sit down and take a break. That's what personally helps me. 
but I also have like a breathing technique I like to do. I always just like step outside if it's necessary. Because the biggest thing is if I don't like listen to myself in the moment, I can struggle with panic attacks and um, derealization and like dissociation where I kind of like shut out the world and everything just kind of feels cloudy and unreal. And it can be really scary when you're alone. So I often usually go with somebody I can trust too. So that way, when that happens, they can kind of just like tell me it's okay and they can help me like come up with a plan. But that was a lot of the struggles that I usually face in public. Hmm. How did you find all those different coping strategies? So when I was younger, my anxiety was at really an all-time high. I constantly had panic attacks. I had a lot of triggers, especially with school. School was not my safe place. It was a place where I was very vulnerable, very on the edge. I was bullied a lot. So I was always like very panicky, very defensive, very anxious. So what worked best for me was to have teachers that I can really trust and safe spaces in the school where I can sit down and take a sensory break if needed. I always made tea before I went to school that kind of helped me like calm down on the bus. And I also recommend getting to your classes early so it can give you plenty of time to transition from like space to space because that way your head is like, okay, it's time to go to social studies now. It's time to get on the bus now. It's time to go home now. And it kind of helps your anxiety like calm down a little bit. Those are great tips. Yeah. Would anyone else like to share your personal experience and how you cope in public spaces? I recently started uh, dating again. I wasn't dating anybody during the pandemic or even slightly before. And so I started to go out to bars, restaurants, uh, sort of the party scene and where there are loud bands or music playing and blasting speakers. That's sometimes a little bit annoying for me and I can only take it for so long unless I position myself in a certain place, like maybe not like right next to the speakers or not blaring in my face. So I might sit in the corner farthest from the speakers or where the music is playing and I can have a conversation or just kind of sit there and drink. And if it gets to be too much, I'll excuse myself to the men's room. That's my out or a way to get away from it for a little bit, but I'm able to still talk to people and manage all of that input. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Knowing yourself and when you need to take a break from everything is really important. I also want to comment on what Tom said real quick. I think that's a great idea. And I actually usually have like an escape plan when I go public places too, because if it gets too overstimulating, it's really nice having like an easy way out. So that way you can like focus on deep breathing or do like some quick, like meditative strategies. Cause I usually do that too. It's like, okay, this is too much for me now. I just need to walk out, kind of take a second to realize where I'm at and then try again. Mm -hmm. Great. And Bob, for me, in certain public space, like I like going out to places, certain places, but there will be times where like going to places too much would be kind of a stressor for me, especially if I'm rushed through them. And it's actually something that's been starting for me. So I'm still trying to maneuver myself through this. If, you know, my fiance and I are going to a place, could, things like that, you know, it's like sometimes... Like it'd be too much. So it's something I'm maneuvering through. Like I'm getting better with it. But it always depends on how I am and and kind of doing what I can to keep myself calm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely feeling rushed isn't very comfortable anywhere at any time. Not at all. Yeah. David, do you have something to share on this topic? For me in public spaces, geography hasn't been necessarily a problem my biggest struggle was voice tone where I like was speaking too loud or speaking too soft 
And then I needed reminders to lower my voice, whether it was going out to dinner with family. There were times when I kind of lashed out at TSA, but that was a long time ago. My parents were my greatest advocates. When I was very little, traveling to New York three or four times a year, or mainly in any urban area, I loved riding metros and subway trains. And I begged my father to take me on every subway ride, and he would just follow me wherever I go. We would stand in the front car. I would just be looking over the window right behind the the driver area. And then my dad had to remind me. And then he pulled me back, which is wait for the other passengers to get off the train before I get, get on the train. And that has really been my favorite part of it. And then right around my teenage years, I could finally take trains myself and getting around in public hasn't really been an issue. And I've definitely been educated well in avoiding stranger things that can happen and not falling into big traps that can hurt your way of self-navigation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, talk more about traveling later on in the discussion. For sure, we'll get into more details about that. Now, back to the establishments that we're talking about, like whether you enter a store or a bar, what do you guys think companies can do better to make their stores more like sensory friendly for neurodiverse people? One thing I could say is I'm going to be realistic. Not every space is going to have like a safe space. But one thing I would advocate for is just kind of like owners having kind of an being aware that there's going to be some neurodivergent, neurodiverse like customers, neurodiverse patrons, and to understand, you know, kind of like and just have them aware that, you know, they're going to do some things to help calm themselves down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tom? I actually saw this in my town here uh, during the pandemic, and it's continuing. Some supermarkets and stores have like a senior hour or an hour on given days where people with special needs, neurodiverse individuals, whatever you might want to call it, can go into the store where there's less crowds, maybe the lights are dimmer more individualized attention. So setting aside that hour, that time frame for people to go in and have a more pleasant or less overwhelming experience, that is definitely something stores are doing and can do. Something that I wanted to add was, have you ever seen those seats in like the front of the grocery store? So sometimes when I get really overwhelmed, those seats can actually be really helpful because they offer you a place to like kind of sit down and like kind of reset. And then you can kind of like get up and finish what you're doing. I don't know if I do it like if you're alone, obviously, because you got to like pay attention to your groceries. But if you're with somebody else, it's a good idea. Yeah, definitely. I I do want to share some ideas that Jeff, one of our community moderators wrote about in his blog. He also mentioned the dedicated hours, like you just said, Tom, where you would lower the store lights, no store announcements over the loudspeaker, having trained assistant animals be welcome, and even um, turning off the checkout beepers, which is something that I never really thought could be a trigger, but it definitely could for some people, right? And he also mentions staff training which is a big one, right? Training employees to handle a situation where maybe a customer might be having a meltdown and what to do in those situations. And it, you know, the reaction might be different for different people who are going through it. But I think just knowing what it is and not to, I don't know, immediately call the cops, for example. He also mentions 
uh, sensory toy bag. So this maybe is kind of related to what you talked about, Mary, like having sensory friendly toys, like stimming toys and headphones that are available for customers. And also another thing he talks about is holding community awareness events. Now this is really huge, right? Just even having a table for more information and more resources for the community. That way it's more inviting for people to come during the sensory friendly hours. And also having a store plan on a map at the front of the store so people can see where things are from an aerial perspective and know where they need to go so they don't get lost and they can, like if they're in a hurry, like what Bob was saying, they know where they need to go straight away and get their shopping done. What do you guys think of these ideas? As you were mentioning them, I came up, or rather I am aware of one uh, on shopping carts at this one store, they have a directory of food items in alphabetical order and what aisle they're on. So you can pick any cart and you'll see like where the eggs are, the milk is, it goes in alphabetical order and gives the aisle number. So that's, that's a good directory and it's helpful. I want to kind of go back to your point about the staff training. That is so important because I just think a lot of times it, it falls on, of course, the parents or the caregivers and they might feel embarrassed or not know what to you know do because of others' perceptions. So when I did have a client, we went to this one Kroger a few times a week to work on some different skills and they were able to see the staff there, you know, how we dealt with overwhelmed situations. And then even the manager from there was like, you know, how can we get you in here to talk to our staff about things like this? Because like we see individuals like this all the time, they don't have a BCBA or a therapist with them. So like, we don't know what to do for that. It made me think, you know, one, it will be good for that individual, right? Because they'll feel like they're supported in some sense. Two, it will also be good for whoever's with them, the the grandmother, the parent to not feel ashamed that the employees don't know what's going on. While they may not be able to fully support, they can at least try to understand a bit better. So I really love that kind of staff training. Again, it it takes a community and that would just really help, I think, all across the board. Yes, exactly. Those are great points. I had another idea. Um, the conversation made me think I went to a silent fitness class and it was outdoors and we all had our headphones and the music was in sync and we can hear the instructor. So having like a silent bar night for someone that wants to go and maybe they can have their own choice of music preferences. And then, you know, if you want to socialize, you can easily take your headphones off or if there's like an outdoor area um, to socialize, that'd be pretty cool. Oh yeah. Like a silent disco. Yeah. I've been to some of those parties before. Yeah. And you could probably adjust the volume on your own headphones. Mm -hmm. That'd be great. Hello, Colleen. Hi. So we are talking about triggers in public spaces. Colleen, do you want to just give a quick introduction and say hello to the community? I don't know if you've met everyone here. Sure. Yes. Hi, I'm Colleen Dorsey. I'm a special education teacher and I'm also a future traveler. I just hit my button on the I will travel in February email I got today. That's a skill core traveler, just so yeah. for people who don't know. I haven't met Danielle or Robert. Congrats, Colleen, on the skill course opportunity. Hi, Colleen. I would love to do skill core as well. Yes, definitely. Sorry, this is a tangent now, but all of the self-advocates here on this call, your expertise on a skill core trip is invaluable. Sharing your experiences, your lived experiences with our partners is something that a lot of them don't have access to in their countries, like hearing from autistic adults. So I definitely encourage you to apply when the time is right for you. Absolutely. I'm definitely going to do it on 2023. Okay. Just one more little sub subtopic on public spaces before we move on. I do want to talk about Halloween because this is just right around the corner. And there have been some blogs circulating and also kind of infographics on social media with tips for autistic people and helping them cope with Halloween stressors. 
Do you guys have anything to share, any personal stories about Halloween and how you coped with it or tips for autistic people? Yes, Mary? So for starters, I would definitely make like a safe path. Some autistic people can like Halloween horror, but some autistic people can get very scared easily and not really like unexpected surprises. So my neighbors, they actually knew I was autistic and they're super sweet. So they actually created a safe path for autistic or neurodivergent kids or just other kids that don't like being scared. And there's no scary Halloween decorations. There's no one jumping out at you. And then you can just ring the back door and they'll be like, oh, hi, happy Halloween. Here's a treat. Like you don't have to dress up or anything. So they're super understanding. So I think we should definitely spread awareness that autistic kids like candy too. And we should definitely have like safer ways for them to trick or treat. I think if they're comfortable with it, they can disclose their diagnosis, but I don't think it should be forced. And I think people should be more understanding about like sensory friendly costumes or no costumes. And even some kids that don't like trick or treating, I think there's other ways for it to be fun. Like you can stay home and have treats and watch Halloween movies, like in your own house, for example. And You could set up outside of your house. Like what I'm going to do, it kind of freaks me out when people ring the doorbell at night, especially like so many times in a row. So I'm going to set out a bowl that says, hi there, please take two, but don't ring the doorbell, please. Noise sensitive. And then they can get the message like, oh, I can still have a treat, but just kind of be more quiet about it is also a nice way to do that for like autistic members in your house. I love that. Yep. Uh, I heard of another technique that was used, particularly during the pandemic and with social distancing and those kinds of measures. What they did was uh, the household members would have like a little ramp or like a slide where they put the candy on and slide or the candy would roll on down. The kids, they were passing by, they could be in a car on the sidewalk. So put the candy and let it fly on down to them. So that could be a way to enjoy the fun, get the candy without having to interact with people as much. (laughs) I love that. I actually do PCA hours. So personal care assistant hours for a girl with cerebral palsy. And her mom showed me that video and was like, well, besides the pandemic, why don't they do this for all our children and people out there that may not be able to get to the front door? And I'm like, that's a great idea. Making it more accessible. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. All right, guys, I think it's time to move on to the next topic, which is workplace stressors. Now, would anyone like to share an experience related to workplace stressors and how you coped with it? Well, I would definitely want to talk about like a job I had. I was a counselor at a, the way you describe it is a halfway house for men we're on last stages of incarceration. Basically, it was a prison. It was a jail. And basically, you know, there was no, like, the higher-ups were very unempathetic towards, like, self-care and mental health. It was very, like, demanding. And I think that kind of, like, gave me a an understanding of what something would be best for me. Like, I had to find out what was best for me. So that's why I moved more into the working with the autism population, not, and I've wanted to work with that population all my life, but since I was a teenager, at least since I was diagnosed and it showed me, you know, what would be a best place for myself where I wouldn't be triggered so much. I love that you turned that situation into finding your true passion. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that, Bob. Welcome. Does anyone else have a story they'd like to share? For me personally, it's making sure that people are really understanding. I usually tell my boss, like, hey, sometimes I get overwhelmed and I just need a minute to really just kind of reset my mind and calm down. Sometimes I might take longer on certain tasks because sometimes my hands are just slippery and they don't work right. And Maybe it's like a bad mental health day and I just need a little bit to kind of get with the plan. So please just like go easy on me, give me extra time. And really, I think just asking for accommodations is the best way to really set up yourself for success in the work field. 
and to find a really understanding boss because my sister, she has a job at a butcher shop. She's been working there for like two years. She slices like meat and cheese and deli and stuff. And her boss is so kind and so accepting of her disabilities. And she gives her breaks when she needs it. Sometimes she helps drive her home. She's very accommodating, which is great. So I think the best way to have a job as a neurodivergent person is to find a boss that's really accepting and will be able to give you the accommodations you need. May I add something onto workplace and accommodations? Mm-hmm. All right. Before I get into that, I thought I would like to do some quick entertainment. <laughs> Sorry about that, guys. <laughs> we were talking about Halloween earlier, and this kind of led me to that. Okay. Is that the Joker? So for people it who are wondering what we're laughing about and won't really be watching the video, David just put on this. Well, first he turned his camera off. So we're all wondering <laughs> what he's doing. And then he turned his camera back on with a mask. That is the Joker mask. It is indeed, and I dressed up as the Joker for (laughs) Halloween last year, and this kind of relates to uh, something I want to bring out, and Thomas Island, I promise you, you're going to kind of get a laugh attack with this. So, in episode 26 of Autism Knows No Borders, I was fortunate to be on the show with Thomas Island on discussing requesting accommodations in education in the workplace. And both of us have said that you are never guaranteed to have your accommodations met just because you've had them back in your education or anywhere. But to avoid the tangent, it is your responsibility to advocate not just for your needs, but also how you learn, and to let your colleagues know that it can generally take time for you to process that specific information or tasks that can be a little challenging. On another note, another thing that kind of annoyed me a lot, but now I've gotten used to is Some last minute outcomes can happen right at the last minute. I could get a text from my boss or a colleague saying, are you still at the office right now? I'm like, I'm sorry, I just left. And then sometimes I run back in and then some people ask me, are you working today? I'm like, "Uh, I am. Would you like me to help you with something? And even if it's not my duty, I take responsibility to help the company take care of it. And they understand that I have these skill sets and that I am willing to also support them, even if I am not working in that specific unit. So therefore, that's also showing the company that you really like this job and you're doing what it takes to succeed in that job. But going back to the episode, we did mention Batman together, and I did say a Joker quote, so that also played a role with me putting on the mask. But yes, I was here. I was listening. I just thought of entertainment. So, Tom, I hope you enjoyed that part as well as all of you do. So, Tom, I would advise you and would love for you to share some other things that you and I discussed in episode 26. Well, that was very entertaining indeed. And and while I may not recall the exact uh, wording of episode 26, I can add as far as workplace stressors and how I overcome or manage those. Piggybacking on, on what Mary mentioned, I found that people don't quit jobs. They quit managers. And if you don't have a manager that is willing and able to work with you, particularly when you're up front with them or what kind of help you need or recognizing how your diagnosis affects you and saying, if you're going to give me a lot of information, can you please put it in writing? Or I might ask you the same question multiple times. If you'll just be patient with me, it will eventually stick. If you're 
being open and honest and forthcoming with them, that that should be met with and respected. Whereas if it's not, then maybe you shouldn't be there. Hmm. Yep. It's also about setting your boundaries, knowing your worth, not being taken advantage of. Yes, exactly. Those are all great points. And I wanted to point something out that Kia shared in the community, which I thought was really interesting. Kia, you posted, I think it was a poll. Was it a poll about emotion-focused coping skills versus problem-focused coping skills? Could you talk about that and what's involved in each one? Yeah, I really, I'm glad you brought that up. I really like that because sometimes we don't realize that we have different types of coping skills. And you might think that one type kind of fits all. That's why it is really important to identify it one for yourself and two so that you can communicate with others because it's just another form of advocacy. So emotion focused coping skills. Some of those examples include exercising, like taking a bath, giving yourself, you know, some words of encouragement, meditating. And then problem focused coping skills are managing your time, making a to-do list, creating some of those, you know, hard, healthy boundaries and asking for support. So for me, I do tend to be more problem focused. And I think with with that, I love a to-do list and I like to do time management because where I find that I get overwhelmed is if something goes wrong as far as a time management or a schedule kind of thing. And then that's when I'll, I'll have a little bit of um, harder time with coping, but I always find that if I, I make a plan, I get through it better versus give myself a pep talk. That doesn't really work for me, but I have, you know, friends and family that if they are stressed out, you know, they'll just stop, take a bath, take a shower, and then they're good to go. So I think it is important to kind of know what's best for you and, you know, be okay with it's not a one size fits all. Some, I want to say Jeff even commented that. He had a bit of a balance between both. And I think that's also good to have a balance between both because sometimes problem focused can be a bit like, you know, work and rigid type, making a list, managing time. And then emotion focused can be more like, okay, where's the solution come into play? Because it's more like, okay, I'm kind of taking a break away from the issue type deal. So I think it's just very healthy to kind of look at that. And I can also... I'll drop that image in the chat box unless any um, in case anybody didn't see it to so recognize it for yourself and, you know, figure out what's best for you. And it might change depending on the situation as well. Thank you, Kia. Colleen, do you have something to add? Yes. I, first of all, I love so much of what everyone was saying. I want to go back to always talking about being our own best advocates, right? Like I teach my students to advocate for themselves. I've learned a lot about advocating for my own self and my work environment as well. And I love how we brought up boundaries. And I feel like David share about showing up for work if he might not be working or that he's willing to work. And then Rachel, you had mentioned boundaries. And I want to talk about the Leadership Academy that I did through the Global Autism Project. I actually, we did a whole unit on self-care, which Kia, you helped me remember this, that we broke down self-care into different areas and I was forced to focus on my professional self-care and I didn't realize how I lacked a lot of boundaries in that sense. Like, do I leave work when I'm supposed to leave work? Do I actually sit down and have lunch? And it's very um, interesting. The boundaries for me for coping in work environments is a big game changer. Yes. Thank you, Colleen. I agree. Yes. Well, so what Kia said with the list, I think lists are great. So I'm currently working on as a developmental disability specialist at a group home and there's always something to do. So I find that the lists are great and especially like crossing things off feels really good. And then finding that work balance and a lot of times it's go, go, go. But there are times where I need to sit down and eat lunch or maybe I just need to get up and go for like a little walk or just do an activity um, with one of the individuals that lives there. Yeah, so everyone's really great. Thank you, Danielle, for what you do. Um, I work with many students in group homes, so I can appreciate your work. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Colleen, I would like to thank you again for reflecting on what I mentioned earlier about being willing to do other responsibilities and my seriousness of being 
punctual and it truly is an honor to be doing some work with you and I really hope we meet in person someday. Thank you, David. I feel the same way. I think I've gotten to know a lot of you guys, whether it's through podcasts or this global autism community. So it'd be so neat if we can finally meet in real life, right? (laughs) Wait for Global Summit. So on that note, I think this might be a good time to take a stretch break, listen to our bodies, do a little bit of self-care. So let's take just, how about two minutes? And then we'll come back and we'll talk about conflicts with other people and end the discussion with tips with traveling. Okay, so let's go into our next subtopic, which is conflicts with other people. Now, this can be definitely stress-inducing for many people. Would anyone like to share a personal story of a time that you had a conflict with someone and how you managed it? I'll begin by saying that it actually started uh, with my family. Uh, And I think we all have family and some of them we get along with, some of them we don't get along with. And we actually, in our own family, came up with a little system in order to manage input and information. So I have a little uh, analogy I'll be describing here and I'll say what I'm doing for the podcast listeners and for those that can't see us. So let's say this water pitcher in my right hand is information or input. And this glass in my left hand is how much I can handle or how much I can take at a given moment. So if someone gives you input or information, they start pouring into that glass. And that glass starts to get full pretty quick. And you have to say when enough is enough because sometimes the glass might overflow. And I have a towel here, so I'm catching that water <laughs> there. So on that note, whenever I'm feeling about to be overwhelmed or have had enough, I will say, the glass is full. That was our family code for you have to back up and shut up now, but as a more polite way to say so. So coming up with that system, I think made a big difference. And I even, I give them kind of a pre-warning now, like glass 98% full, silence advised. And then when I say the glass is full, it's silence required or quiet, please. And they will respect my wishes. So even within your own family, and that system works within our family. If you say it to another person outside the family or like a police officer or something, you say the glass is full, that's not going to register with them. So it depends on the system or the company that is around you and as to what code you're going to use. So the glass is full is my family's code for enough. I love that, having that kind of safe word so that everyone knows, everyone's on the same page, everyone can respect it and identify it. That's a great idea, Tom. Have you guys heard of the spoons theory? Yes, I have. Can you explain it, Mary? Yeah, that's something that I actually use. It's kind of like a term for the disability community where 12 spoons, you're given them every day. It takes like a spoon to get up, get out of bed, get dressed. And then it maybe takes two spoons to study or do your homework, eat a meal. But then it takes like four spoons to go somewhere, take a walk, things like that. And it basically describes overstimulation because once you're out of spoons, you can't really like continue. So sometimes I tell my sister or my parents, like, I'm out of spoons. I just can't do it. And that's kind of my funny way of saying, like, please just let me relax right now. But also in terms of conflict, usually my sister and I do butt heads, which is funny because we're both neurodivergent and we both have very different ways and expectations that we want our day to go. So sometimes my sister is point A and I'm point B. And then usually we're fighting because I want point A and she wants point B. So we both have to coin point C, if you will. And there was one time where we were sleeping over at my mom's house and we had to share a room and we're like, this is not going to go well. (laughs) So we had to coin, we could leave the closet light on because we both like sleeping with a little bit of light just in case we have to get up or anything. But she really likes sleeping to pop music and I like sleeping to piano. 
So we coined this idea where we could listen to pop piano. So that way we <laughs> both get what we want. And then the conflict is solved. So really what we do is we sit down and we create an idea where everyone's happy. So that way we're not constantly fighting. Right. Negotiation. That's key. Especially when you're trying to reach a goal with someone who maybe sees something differently than you. Yeah. I really like that. And I love the spoons, Mary. I haven't, I've never heard of that, but it's like when you like reach your capacity, sometimes it's just easier to say that like I'm out of spoons versus having to express I've reached my capacity and kind of feel like you have to explain yourself more. And that I love that that's already like an established phrase for you. So you can leave it at that and not get even more overwhelmed trying to explain that you've reached your capacity in whatever the situation is. So thank you for sharing that. I really like that. Yeah, because especially me, when I go into sensory overload, I don't know if anyone else here struggles with this, but I have a hard time communicating. I usually go into like a shutdown pretty easily with all the like extra stimuli, especially when I start getting overwhelmed. And then I have issues like kind of talking about it and being like, I'm stressed out because of X, Y, and Z. Instead, I'm just like, I can't do this anymore. I'm out of spoons. I'm going to go wait outside or I'm going to go wait in the car. And then that's kind of our way of coining a plan. So that way I can be safe. I'm not like bumping into anything and they don't have to like worry about me either. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think there's, I don't know, something about detaching yourself from the actual thing that's happening by referring to it as something else, whether it's a glass of water or spoons. I almost was going to use something with my husband when I sometimes can get moody, depending on some hormones. And it's hard and when you're in the moment to say that you're being moody. But if you say code word, it just kind of separates yourself from that emotion and makes it a little bit easier to, to express that you're going through it. Listening to Mary explain the spoons made me think of a analogy or visual that I saw that I turned into analogy to help my students understand. Has anyone ever seen that visual? You know how we live in a world of technology and we have all our tabs open. There's those visuals that say, don't forget to close the files in your brain too, or my brain has too many tabs open. And I feel like I've used that to help my students understand sometimes like, marry that sensory overload, right? Like you can have so much happening at once. And it, when I said like, I have all these files open in my head, it helped them understand what was what was going on and how I was feeling in that moment. Mm, I like that too. I really relate to that because personally, I'm a night owl and all the stimulation from the day can really build up that sometimes I have trouble sleeping. So what I like to do is I like to have an hour where I call stim time. So I'll shut my door I'll put on some music. I'll kind of like dance in my room or kind of like just hang out, draw something on my iPad. And that's like the one to two hours before bed where it's like just me. I can decompress. I can write out my thoughts and then I can really get all those thoughts out of my head. So I'm not worried about anything. I'm not struggling to sleep. It's a lot more like peaceful. There is something else that is always a good relief when handling conflicts with people. One of them is reading a kind note from a friend and even opening a folder of photos that you have created from all the memories of the friendships you have established. And there is something very serious that I was berated on during high school which caused very serious conflict, not just in me, but also what I had to go through and put up with for very undefined reasons. The summer before high school, I found my second family, a summer camp family who is gratefully a part of my autism journey when I gave them my speech about what it is like to be autistic. They celebrated accepted me and for who I am as a person. And this was actually in high school and at school, a multidisciplinary special needs school I attended. Anytime I wanted to share 
any adventure that I've had over the years and how it has benefited my own well-being. I never got the respect I deserved by two or three people. The rest of the classroom did, thankfully, but there were always at least two or three people who never gave me that respect. And as it was hurting my feelings, and when I was moving to the next class, I briefly look at the photos I put in my locker. I ask my family saying, what do I do? What do I do? I even put those photos in my school binder as a little stress relief so that I can have them with me and that I can remember all that they have given me and what they have done for me. And what's most important was the summer before high school, I found my BFF, my long life best friend, and I am more than happy to reveal his name, Samuel Frolix Dean Appel, my closest friend I would ever be lucky to have. One thing that I have learned is it always requires patience. There will be a gift out there for you. It's just a matter of taking it when you least expect it. And something remarkable will always come, no matter what. And this is a photo, a very cute photo, of us together at summer camp as campers. And that is me hugging him right by the stomach. And that is just, that just puts tears of joy. And I would briefly share this binder that I have. These are actually photos from the Israel trip, which was right before junior year of high school, which has absolutely changed our lives for the better. And those people meant everything for me. It was unpredictable that I would find another family who could support me over the conflicts that I was facing with others, all because of whatever I had and whatever I wanted to do. And even when I got home from school, right before homework, I read these very precious notes that always put me to tears. And I will read one, a very good one that made me cry when I read it. And this is from my friend, Abigail Turetsky. David, thanks for always having great insightful comments and always being so appreciative of any act of kindness. You have a truly wonderful personality and always stay true to yourself. Hope you have an amazing year and many more times. And I cried almost every time. And it, it's just like this. There was no clear answer as to why I was being disrespected for my travels and for finding another family full of worldwide friendships. When that happened, my camp family was there. When I came home crying for something terrible that happened to me, my camp family was there. And even when I was struggling with my exams, even applying for the colleges and feeling anxious to get into my dream school, my camp family was there. They were everything for me, even if I had limited time to talk to them. They were there for me, and we are there for each other. Without them, I would never have these worldwide friendships that I have to this moment. That's beautiful, David. Thank you for sharing that. That was great, David. You know, what, one thing I do have to say is that when it comes to family, it's not always going to be blood related. Sometimes you might find the people the most closest to you are not blood related at all. They can be, they can be your true family. Yes, exactly. Bob, do you have anything to share about coping with situations with other people, maybe your family or your very close friends? I can definitely say that there has always been times where, especially like with my family, like times where it's my me and family, where we wouldn't like get along and there'd be friends and people who, who I wouldn't get along who would 
I would always feel like I'm annoying them or I always feel that they're I'm bothering them. And you know what? I just have to find a common ground with others. You know, there's going to be days where I get, I would get frustrated with people or they would be frustrated with me. And the thing about it is that I would have to, what I need to do is just find a common ground. Like, let's see each other where we're at. Let's, okay, why are we upset at each other? Okay, let me hear you out. You hear me out. And then let's find, let's find ourselves the common ground. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes when you're just in the heat of the moment, you kind of lose sight that you guys might actually have the same goal. All right. I'd like to open it to our audience members. If you have any questions on this topic for any of the self-advocates. Not so much a a question, but I just want to say that I love the strategies that you guys have um, shared so far. You know, as a neurotypical person, sometimes, you know, we don't even have strategies. So it's important for for me to let you all know that we are learning from each other. And I really appreciate the visual time that you gave was, I mean, it was like fantastic. I hadn't heard of the spoons and, you know, even David and and Bob, you know, your, your stories of your personal kind of experience with it is something that we can all learn from. So I just appreciate the transparency with everybody on this specific topic because it can kind of be a little bit hard and, you know, uncomfortable to talk about. So I just wanted to, you know, point that out that I love that we're doing this because we can truly learn from each other. It's it's not one-sided at all. Yeah. Thank you, Kia. Thank you so much, Kia. All right. Now let's move into our last topic, which is tips while traveling. Earlier, David mentioned, you know, taking the train with his dad. And so are there any, I guess, common triggers for autistic people while traveling, whether it's taking a plane and you're at the airport or taking a train and you're at the train station or bus stop? Is there something that you think could be a common trigger for people? For me, I think driving is a big, can be a trigger for me. Like, I don't mind taking a plane, train, bus, what have you, or even like being in the passenger seat of a car. For me, it's always like driving because, you know, I drive a lot, sometimes not even by my decision. And I don't know, it just always feels very stressful for me just trying to get from one place to another by driving, especially if it's like a long distance at a short amount of time, it really is very stressful for me. And just, I think what helps me though, is just trying to get an early start with my drive and just knowing where exactly it is, like how many miles it is, just having that information beforehand is really helpful for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could see that. And for me, I think the uh, most uh, sometimes unpredictable or anxiety provoking parts of travel is when I'm flying and I have a connecting flight and let's say the first flight is delayed or something happens to where that window of layover that I have gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I have made some flights just in time. I've also missed a few just because of certain issues. So I'm having to think ahead or if I know I'm going to have a connecting flight, I'll see how much time I have between or how much leeway I've got. And then I'll pack my suitcase accordingly. Like some small planes, you have to put your plane in the cargo hold and they'll valet it up a a run like a jetway. And that could take another five or 10 minutes. So I might travel really light and pack accordingly. So there's a lot of preparation involved in having to learn the hard way in some cases. But I think my saving grace, if you will, is with all the years I've been flying, I have like a platinum status. So I can go to like an admiral's club and say, I missed a flight. Can you help me book a new one? And they'll assist with that. That's always great to have that in your back pocket. For me, it's personally um, the new places, all the sights and sounds. What I like to do personally is keep a thought journal on me. So that way I can always write down what I feel like, oh, hey, journal, I'm stressed when I do this. And also, I kind of like to do my own little version of expecto patronum, 
if you like Harry Potter, you know what that is. Um, but basically, I think very good thoughts. I think of my family. I think of my friends. I think of just things that I love and keep me in a positive mindset. So that way I can't let the stress like overwhelm me. And that's what I really like to do during takeoff because takeoff is kind of uncomfortable for me. I'm not crazy about landing either when it comes to flights. So that's usually what I do. I like to take little stress balls with me. This is my little penguin rose. Uh, This is my favorite thing to just kind of squeeze. Helps me with stress. And I also like to keep like a little to-do list of things I like to do and I rank them in order. Like first you have to get to the airport and then, you know, check in security. And then when you get to your destination, obviously you just figure out the rest of your to-do list. But that's another thing that really helps me when traveling to help a lot with stress and kind of keep me in the right mindset. Yeah, those are great ideas. could see how even having a list during that time will keep you grounded and focused on what's next so you don't have to look too far ahead. David, do you have something to share, world traveler? Oh, I do. This is a pretty unforgettable moment of my travel history. I will be as concise as I can. But before that, I've been traveling since I was two months old. My family laid the groundwork for world travel, and I am more than grateful that world travel has become the gift of my dreams, and it will be forever and always. So now on to the incident. Following New Year's Eve 2012, my family and I were going back to Los Angeles from Islamabad. We received a phone call from Etihad Airways that our flight is delayed due to a heavy fog. We took the first flight out of Islamabad, uh, being accommodated one night in Abu Dhabi. From Abu Dhabi, we took the first flight on Etihad Airways to JFK, much longer than expected due to the wind conditions. It was 14 hours. We expected it to be crowded because everyone was going home and it was the end of the holiday season. Following our descent into JFK, It took more than 30 minutes to get to the gate because we were waiting for three planes to take off. We had to disembark really fast, go through customs. My parents and I had a seven o'clock flight on American Airlines. It even took more time to get our luggage from Terminal 4. Due to the air train out of service, we crammed into one shuttle bus. Once we arrived at Terminal, American Airlines Terminal 8, leaving Terminal 4 International at JFK. We met up with my grandmother, who was so kind to be there for us, and my brother, where we said goodbye really fast. We checked in our luggage, but we weren't able to get our luggage on the flight we were on. After we checked in through security, we heard the final boarding call for our flight to LA. My parents and I jogged to the concourse on the other side of the terminal, and we made it 10 minutes before they closed the gate. I was so grateful. My parents told me, you saved our lives, and I was happy that I did, thanks to my geographic skills. And with that kind of delay, where you have no control over catching that precious flight that you need, Never take this for granted. Sometimes you will be accommodated. Sometimes you won't. But that is never guaranteed. You have to take it as it happens. And things will happen for a reason. I was very inflexible. Traveling challenged my flexibility. And this unforgettable experience has certainly done that. Mom and dad, if you are listening to this, you would feel more than proud that you have witnessed me sharing that story that happened a decade ago. And I I really just can't say it out of my mouth, how difficult but unforgettable it was, how 
scared and anxious we were, but we made it in time. We slept the whole way. And we were fortunate that the airline crew was so generous to be accommodating and how beneficial it is to have family in certain parts of the world who can give you the needed hospitality if something goes wrong. You mentioned something about things that are out of your control, David, and I think that's something to remember when we're in stressful situations, right? Like if something is out of our control, can we let go of it if there's nothing we can do about it? We can try our best to, but it will take time to process it. Yeah. And even to this moment, it takes a lot of time for me to process it. All right, everyone, we are coming to a close here. And if you guys have just any last words, maybe some advice to other self-advocates on the topic of coping with stress and sensory overload. I will say as a coach, I have a mantra that was a basis for my book, and that's know yourself, love yourself, be yourself. And when you can identify what sets you off or what overwhelms you and be able to say and not be afraid to say, I need to take a break or I've had enough or please stop. Even the word no or stop. That is a complete sentence and people need to respect that. So do not be afraid to say what you really feel or what you need for yourself because that's going to save you a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of trouble down the road. Yep. I really love what you said. And to also, yes, be honest. Be absolutely honest on how you feel because honesty is bravery. If you're honest on how you feel, then you can take on the world. For me personally, I would say try lots of different coping mechanisms and definitely see what works. And the ones that do work, I would say to like make a list in your head and just keep those close by. So that way, when you need them, you like have them on you. I agree with all that the advocates have said. Find ways that will help you stay in the moment and don't feel too stressed about whatever is going on. Take it as it happens because it will count and it will change your life for the better. This is off topic, but very quickly, as many of you know, November 1st is on Monday. And there are two days left to determine what November's monthly theme will be. I posted a poll about three topics that we will potentially move forward with. The one with the most votes is what we will proceed with. So if you have or haven't, please do your votes. Every vote counts. If you're having trouble finding the poll, feel free to reach me. But other than that, back on topic, always find something that will keep you calm. Thanks for that reminder about next month's theme, David. All right, everyone. Thank you again so much for sharing and opening up. And I know some of these topics aren't easy to talk about. So I really appreciate you guys feeling comfortable here. Know that this is your global autism family as well. Thanks, guys. Have a good night. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good night. Nice meeting everyone. Rachel, you laid the groundwork for this family to come together. Oh. (laughs) Yes, you have. Absolutely. Well, I I do give lots of credit to our moderators, Kia and David and Jeff, too, for keeping the community going strong day after day after day. So we wouldn't be here without you guys. (laughs) Thank you. We love this community and these type of discussions are they're so great. So Thank you guys for joining. Yeah. Thank you. Hope to see you all again next month. Yes. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Dealing with stress and sensory overload can be extremely exhausting for autistic individuals. With the right support and strategies to mitigate the effects of triggers, people can learn to manage their stress in a healthy way. Knowing yourself, requesting accommodations, and setting aside time for self-care 
are great tips from the advocates in this episode. What are some ways that you cope with stressful situations? Would you like to share your experiences with people from all over the world and maybe attend our next roundtable discussion? Join us today at community.globalautismproject.org. Let's work together to transform how the world relates to autism. Thanks for listening. Take care. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. You've been listening to Autism Knows No Borders, brought to you by the Global Autism Project. You can find Rachel's notes for this episode and learn more about today's guests at autismknowsnoborders.com. If you enjoyed this episode, please kindly rate the show and leave a review. By doing so, you'll be helping us increase awareness and acceptance of autism around the world. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.